morning and hello to everyone. We were planning this event early this year, obviously in physical mode. World has changed since that, but urgency of this topic not just stays, but it has even increased. Original motivation of this event was rather simple. I believe that digital education is an important topic and it is something close to my heart too, not only due to my past. I graduated in mathematics, I worked in finance and economics where I benefit greatly from my education. But more importantly, I look at it also as a father of three children, two of them still goes to middle school. Secondly, the competence in digital sphere is key for success of firms or even of the governments. Now, there are hardly any fields of business where IT or at least good availability of data and ability to work with them is not precondition of the success. Last not least, today's world is world full of extremely aggressive competition. As IT plays such an important role and competition is more and more global, for Europe to succeed, we need to do much better in this area to be sure that we support our very strong position in many fields of the economy. Looking around how IT uh, education works at school, how successful are governments in digita digitalization, one can have some concerns. On the top of that, these days, there are challenges associated with today's terrible crisis caused by coronavirus. Those governments that are better with data and technologies <clears throat> are clearly better equipped to deal even with this crisis. At the same time, kids and students in many places, including my country, are again out of the school. If teachers and students do well in online work, the loss of education case can stay relatively low. And at the same time, students can get sk skills essential for their future life. What I can see around me is that there are a lot of schools, firms and governments that do very well. But very often opposite is true. So we need improvement. And there are no what fits all models and also there are different ways how to reach badly needed improvement. And this is exactly the topic of our morning debate. We will hear what the top level politicians can do, how firms can boost the digital know-how in some schools, how private businesses can stimulate interesting and attractive IT learning, and how large firms are making sure that their staff have the required standards of knowledge. But before we start and before I turn the microphone to panelists, let me share with you one simple idea that originated in pandemic lockdown. I call it EU eSchools. I believe that digital education must start at school at every level and not only in the best schools, but in all schools. It must reach all. Many of you may come from countries where programming skills and kind of eSchooling is part of a regular curriculum, but it is not the case everywhere. And differences among the school, even with one country, are often very large. That's why EU. We should use experience from this terrible pandemia, where everyone had to adapt to new environment. Many schools started immediately with online teaching on many different platforms. It was something completely new to students, as well as for the teachers. But I saw at home that it can work. Why I'll call it e-schooling. The purpose is not to replace normal school education, but make part of it. What are the benefits of situation where our kids will be able to do e-learning, manage to do online courses, will normally use distance tools and will be used to work in teams? It would improve digital skills and support individual work and responsibility. This change should be used also as the way how to reduce amounts of course materials and focus on the most important facts. And it, it should bring involvement of parents. That is sometimes very important too. Focus on teamwork, sometimes inten intentional, sometimes also unintentional because kids are trying to make their life easier always. is something that they can use a lot in their future professional life. Of course, it brought many challenges, especially for low income families or the families with kids with special needs. And there are a lot of discussion about teacher and students not having only right technology, but also about problem of lack of incentive among teachers that should not be underestimated. But, uh, but good examples have shown that we can move quickly and it is not problem of money. There are funds from EU as well of national governments to support it. So I believe it's now time to change and schools are not only beginning, but play very important role. Almost anything can now have e-prefix, 
we are talking about e-government, e-banking, e-health. And these are not terms from visionary talks anymore. It is reality of 21st century, which we need to improve more these days. If we can try hard, I believe we can do it. So I have vision of EU-wide project of EU eSchool 1.0, where we should share across the member state the best practices, develop optimal software for distance learning, provide good tools and materials for teaching of kids and improving the skills of the teachers. As part of that, we should create sharing platform and databases with high quality, easy to use the programs for e-learning across EU and so allow teachers and kids to have access to best quality of teaching materials. Not just someone, but everyone. And let me finish here and let me now warmly welcome our first speaker. It's Madam Commissioner Maria Gabriel who is not only a great title for, uh, because she's responsible for innovation, research, education and youth, but I know her as a very hardworking person from European Parliament and also as someone who really tries to make Europe a better place for us and for our kids. Maria Gabriel is also Vice President of European People's Party, which I belong to also, and Vice President of EPP Women. Previously, she was a member of European Parliament 2009-2017. Uh, she has a master's degree from Comparative Politics and International from Academy of uh, Political Science in Bordeaux. So, Maria, tell us uh, how we can do better and welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Niedermayer. Dear Ludwig, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to join you today. First of all, thank you very much, dear Ludwig, for organizing this event. We need, we need discussions like this one. And I very much welcome the opportunity that you give to me to share with you some thoughts and some of our initiatives in order to, to see together how we can really achieve better results. So I believe, I believe that we need to inspire more young people to choose these career paths, STEM and ICT, and make them understand better the great opportunity it can provide. And such an approach will benefit the younger generation and the European economy and society. It will respond to the call to prepare citizens for the challenges we face and to increase our own readiness for the digital transformation. So today I would like to address this topic sharing with the wider context and why first it is urgent to act. I will also touch after on the successful ongoing initiatives and what new ideas and measures have been proposed in my two flagship communications adopted at the end of last month. So first about the context. It is true that the digital transformation has been going on for some time. But the pace of this change has increased dramatically in the last few months. It has penetrated every aspect of life. It is reshaping society, the labor market and the future of work. Without basic digital skills, it is becoming increasingly difficult to participate effectively in the digital economy and society. And without advanced skills, we cannot move forward discovering, for example, new ways to address the challenges through science and technology. The COVID-19 crisis has only accelerated this process. The last few months have been particularly difficult to all sectors of our economy and society. We have been trying to navigate through uncharted territory, including in the field of digital education, given the unprecedented use of technology for learning. Digital technologies have been a huge enabler for everyone, yet not everyone has the skills to be empowered by them. And this opens up a significant risk of exclusion. To deal with this challenge, digital skills are a must. Despite the growing demand for STEM skills in Europe, there are low levels of achievement and interest in maths and science. In Europe, one in five 15 year old is still functionally illiterate in these subjects. And according to the latest data, these trends are not improving. Our citizens also lack digital skills. Only 44% of, of Europeans have digital skills. This is a major obstacle to digital transformation and it's only 37% of our labor force. Moreover, the digital divide related to gender socioeconomic background and urban-rural areas persist 
further limiting the chances of those who need these skills the most. So we need to address these issues. In particular, only one in three STEM graduates are a woman. On average, women make up only 17% of tech sec sector jobs. The problem with the participation rate arises at all levels of the digital economy, including to the number of women as employees, corporate leaders and entrepreneurs. At the same time, we lack enough people with advanced skills. 57% of enterprises that recruited or tried to recruit ICT specialists reported difficulties in filling such vacancies. And this brings me to my second point. What are already the good in initiatives that we have at our disposal? Also, as a former commissioner for digital economy and society, I'm glad that the commission has taken various measures to address these challenges and we continue to actively promoting, aimed at supporting the development of digital skills and competencies. First, in 2018, ICT and STEM competencies have been an essential part of our focus on key competencies, as defined in the Council recommendation of key competencies for lifelong learning. This has brought clarity to the debate, a starting point from which we can work. Second, we have supported the establishment of the STEM coalition of national STEM platforms, as well as the STEM Alliance, a platform that brings together companies, ministries of education and stakeholders. Another platform, the Scientix Network, allows STEM teachers, researchers and policymakers to come together and develop solutions to this challenge. I think that maybe it's really time to popularize this because I'm not sure that in all our regions, in all our member states, it's very well known who is the national contact point, who we can really contact in order to have more information and how we can participate. So I think that thanks to this, to this event, we can continue to share this information with as much as possible regions and people in order to see how we can improve things. Third, the Commission has supported numerous initiatives in the area of STEM education through the Erasmus Plus program. For instance, by driving systemic changes in the European Union, we launched a call for forward-looking projects and promoting innovative and cross-disciplinary approaches to STEM teaching. Of course, all these efforts first will continue in the context of our larger initiatives in education, training and skills. And specifically here, I'm thinking of the European education area, the updated European skills agenda, and the new digital education action plan. First, the European education area, which I presented at the end of September. For us, it's an ambitious vision for education at European level, to incentivize and support people to upskill and reskill. The area will include a European approach to micro-credentials. They will be essential in allowing adult learners, usually with less flexibility on how they manage their time to acquire new skills and adapt to the new digital reality of a rapidly changing labor market. At the same time, the European skills agenda will build strong partnerships to support business through a new pact for skills by matching skills to job needs and requirements and developing tools to make <laughs> long learning a reality across Europe. Furthermore, the new agenda will create a framework to unlock member states and private investment for skills. This should help reach our objective to have 70% of European adults with at least basic digital skills by 2025. And we'll continue with some of our successful actions already in place, building on them. For instance, the European Digital Skills and Jobs Coalition made an important contribution during the COVID-19 crisis, launching a call for pledges for organizations aimed at supporting the development of digital skills and digital solutions. As a result, more than 70 pledges addressing different beneficiaries like teachers, seniors, workers were submitted often directly supporting the development of digital skills during confinement. But given the growing demand, this effort should continue. And therefore, companies 
public bodies and social partners are encouraged to make new pledges. This type of partnerships is essential to address the digital and STEM skills gap we face. Both the skills agenda and the European education area will play an important role in enabling ICT and STEM careers, empowering our communities to meet the challenges of our time. For the workforce on the few of the future, I believe we need a digital education as a foundation. This is why I presented a new digital education action plan. With the approaching economic crisis, digital education will support us when we need to change jobs or to adapt. As Commissioner for Education, my key priority is to promote high quality, inclusive, future-oriented education and training that uses technology to support all learners, regardless of gender, age or background. Now, the plan sets out a vision for digital education covering all levels and sectors throughout life. This is particularly relevant for effectively addressing digital skills gaps and preparing future generations in key areas related to science, technology, engineering and mathematics. Let me give you specific examples. First, the plan will contribute to supporting the ICT. People that are engaged in learning or working in this field. We plan to introduce computing education in schools, which will start at an early age. Second, we'll build on the success of the Digital Opportunity Traineeship Initiative. Remember, we launched this initiative when I was Digital Commissioner in January 2018. We already have 12,000 participants, students and recent graduates. And just we build on the opportunity to acquire hands-on experience in the digital field. Now, we would like to scale up the scheme to include teachers, trainers and other educational staff and to offer them opportunities for professional development in digital education. So now this scheme will be extended to include traineeships for learners and apprentices from the VET sector for vocational and education training sector as VET systems are well placed to respond to the skills challenges of the digitalization. In addition, we'll develop a European Digital Skills Certificate that will allow Europeans to demonstrate their level of digital competence and facilitate recognition. This will make employers' challenges easier to overcome. We definitely need, need common European criteria because actually we have so many online courses, different platforms, but if we don't recognize the efforts made by people that are following this, it will be very difficult to convince them to preserve and to keep the motivation during <clears throat> entire years. Second, the plan brings everyone closer to the ICT and STEM areas of knowledge, especially those that are often marginalized by focusing on inclusion. For example, we'll focus on closing the gender gap <clears throat> in the digital sector. We cannot afford to have, to have half of our population locked out of this promising field. Taking actions will help us make full use of Europe's talent potential. To that end, and in order to increase the attractiveness of digital and STEM studies and careers for girls and women, we'll support the STEM coalition to develop new higher education curricula for engineering and ICT. In particular, we'll focus <clears throat> on team approach. STEM fields are often at least seen as less attractive because they are abstract. So we are adding context to STEM, bringing the social sciences and the arts into the mix. Third, we'll continue to promote outreach events like the European Code Week, which encourages creativity, problem solving and collaboration <coughs> through programming and other tech activities. Over the last seven years, nearly 10 million young people have participated in it, learning how to make the most out of digital technologies. And we also want to provide young people with great role models, breaking stereotypes and showcasing great science. This is why I will launch a new initiative, Researchers at School, 
bringing our scientists closer to our pupils to present their project and interact directly with them. I believe the humanization of science and ICT is what we need to attract more young people to this field, raising the level of STEM studies and careers. So, dear participants, the COVID-19 crisis has led to a greater awareness of the need to improve the use of technology in education and training. It has also shown that joining forces and to working together on digital education has never been more vital than today. So the Commission, as you can see, will continue to play an active role in bringing together different stakeholders, identifying, sharing and scaling up good practices. We can support member states and the education and training community with tools, platforms and expertise. We also need to make sure that we support our comprehensive digital education strategy through effective use of European funds. It will be particularly important to use the opportunities available out of, out under the new resilience and recovery facility, which will support member states in their endeavors to prepare for the digital transition. Remember, 20% <clears throat> will be invested in digitalization, with education and training being a key area to invest in. We need to focus on all these opportunities to see how, what we can do more for basic skills, for specialized skills, for the successful rollout of digital technologies. So today I hope that this event with this conference will find, found more answers to important questions, like what I already touched. What are the needs? How to tackle them? What are the instruments at our disposal? What are the necessary investments? And how to promote good practices? So I think finally, in conclusion, that to overcome this unprecedented situation and recover from the current crisis, we need to invest in education. I strongly believe that our young people with their talents and skills are really the driver to contribute to make Europe more resilient, inclusive and sustainable. And finally, to help us as Europe, as continent, as society and as economy to lead in the digital age. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Commissioner, uh, dear Maria. Uh, <clears throat> I know that you have a very busy day and uh, before you leave, I just want to ask you one simple question. Uh, in Czech Republic, uh, I don't hear very often about EU strategy on ITs, about EU plans, how to increase the digital education. And I guess this is not unusual. Uh, the countries consider education as the sole area of responsibility, actually area of sole responsibility. And as the consequence, they are rather tolerant to activities of EU Commission or EU institutions, then they would be encouraging more exchange of, uh, of ideas, more exchange or spreading of the best practices. So how you can see the role of, uh, of EU in bringing some kind of convergence, at least to minimum level of EU, uh, EU, uh, EU IT uh, education and to which extent the problem that we are facing is problem of money and to which extent rather knowing how to do it. Thank you very much, Ludek, for this for this question. You are completely right. We we definitely need to promote more and give more visibility to our initiatives. But first of all, I think that that was one of the lessons learned during the crisis. Remember what's happened with our ministers of education. For the first time, we met every month. That was never done before. Every month, we exchanged, exchanged good practices, how to use the different horizontal initiatives, the different funds. I remember that at the beginning, not all our member states were, uh, were aware, for example, that they can use Corona Response Investment Initiative with the European Social Fund and the European Regional Fund to help their digital education processes. And that's why, for me, the base is the platform that we created with our ministers and we started to exchange regularly. For me, this platform created for the occasion of this COVID-19 crisis should be a regular, regular, regular tool that we, we should continue to exchange this. Second, very concrete initiatives. First, in the Digital Education Action Plan, for the first time, we would like to make recommendations for online and 
online learning in primary and secondary education. We need, we need here and for the first time, we launch a strategic dialogue with member states to facilitate successful digital education. That means, for example, that we should continue to work on European digital education content framework. And that's why I'm very glad that in the Digital Education Action Plan, we launched a feasibility study of a European exchange platform to share certified online resources and link existing platforms. Second, what is our maybe more most concrete answer that we propose to create a new European digital education hub in order to link national and regional digital education initiatives and actors to support cross-sector collaboration and new models for exchange of digital learning content, addressing issues such as common stand standards, interoperability, accessibility and high quality assurance. So what is the purpose of this digital education hub? The hub will serve as a think tank supporting the development of policy and practice and monitor the development of digital education in Europe, including the implementation of the new digital education action plan. And that's my wish that we have a digital education hub in all our member states and that they will work in network in order to assure this coherence. Remember, that was never done before. We, stay, we, we have to respect our competencies, but I think that there is a huge window of opportunity thanks to this crisis, not only to see this unprecedented shift to online learning and digital technologies, but really to make best use of this and to see how it's strengthen cooperation, with strengthen coordination and with common initiatives so we can really tackle back best, better the, the challenges. So you can see that that's, that's my intention with full respect of the national and European competencies to strengthen the cooperation, to have the digital education, uh, the education hub and to continue to promote uh, common, common standards and to have common frameworks. Thank you very much, Maria. It sounds terrific uh, to me. I just hope also the others that are more relevant in, in this process will consider also this terrific, but I guess it can really move us, uh, move us forward. So I very much appreciate uh, not only your participation here today, but especially your work and your dedication. I wish you good luck and a good rest of the day. It was great to have you here, at least for the beginning, and stay safe and see you soon, hopefully, in different and on online world, despite of the fact that this online world is obviously fantastic and this is future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much and have a very, very rich and uh, useful discussions. Thank you, Ludek, again for the organization of this wonderful event. Thank you. So let me now move a little bit further. Uh, as I have mentioned, uh, it's hard to be impressed about quality of IT education in our schools. Learning how to write the text or use the Excel tables is clearly not enough. We are trying to improve, for example, through, uh, through initiative of different IT clubs, like the club that I'm representing in Czech Republic called the Dojo. And I was impressed to see that some firms are making a, a very successful effort how to move individual schools in promoting uh, sustain, uh, uh, knowledge of the students in the area of IT. There are probably, <clears throat> and I hope many, many other projects, projects but I'm talking especially about program by uh, IBM called PTEX Schools that is in the Czech Republic represented by, uh, by our next speaker that is Karolina Kosetikova. Karolina Kosetikova is IBM CSR leader for Central and Eastern Europe. She has got experience from small and global private companies as well from non-profit organization. Uh, she was always cooperating on international projects too. She graduated from Faculty of Social Science at Charles University, co-founded Graphic Studio and built it into company with clients across the EU. She's also leading international gender policy network with members organizations in 23 countries that gained EU consultancy status. So uh, can you, Christina, share with us the experience from your PTEC project? Yes, thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, 
as you said, I'm based in Prague in Czech Republic and I'm responsible for corporate social responsibility in IBM. Um, and I'm passionate about the education, which is also a very key topic in IBM CSR. Um, on a long-term basis, uh, many of my colleagues in IBM as volunteers are involved in all levels of education. Uh, some of them implement activities in kindergartens or elementary schools. As many other companies, uh, IBM is having university relations program. A lot of my colleagues are considering sharing their expertise integral part of their job. Also, IBM is fully aware about the data Ludwig Niedermeyer and Madam Commissioner mentioned. From the very beginning of this century, we could see the trends of growing number of vacancies and at the same time growing number of unemployed who did not have these skills for these jobs. We also knew that to be able to enter these jobs, you often do not need to study university. And that was the reality behind the program uh, Ludwig Niedermeyer mentioned, which is uh, our key program for high schools and it's called Pathways to Technologies PTEC. And I would like to share more information about this program with you. PTEC is, as I mentioned, educational program for high schools, which is implemented in close cooperation with industry partners, universities and governments, founders of schools, and it's effective public-private partnership supporting changes in education. First, PTEC school was launched in 2011 in Brooklyn, New York, and based on this program, children from disadvantaged families started to join companies like IBM. Since then, in US, the program was a success and gained respect from the US government. And it was also adopted to the national education systems in 24 countries, including six countries in Europe, concretely Czech Republic, France, Ireland, Italy, Netherlands, Poland, plus UK. And I'm proud Czech Republic was among these first EU countries which opened PTEC schools. So what is so special about this program? We are innovating the curriculum so that it better reflects the needs related to digitalization. Students are better prepared for their future jobs and also for their everyday life, I would say. PTEC supports students in flexibility, ability to solve problems. Students learn how to cooperate in team, but also how to fulfill tasks on their own. While implementing concrete projects, students learn how to manage a project or how to communicate within the team, but also outside the team, how to best introduce their work. How to ask experts for support is also integral part of this program. In IT, students never more in PTEC schools learn Word, Excel or PowerPoint, as Dick mentioned before, but the teachers together with industry experts introduce them areas like cybersecurity, artificial intelligence or blockchain. And this way, the kids will be also able to find out what they want to do or what they don't want to do in their future, which is also an important part. Industry partners also try their best to motivate students for STEM explain why it's important and how they can really use it in practice. And what does PTEC in Czech Republic uh, concretely include? Um, above all, it's cooperation of all partners relevant in education. Currently, we have five high schools, one college, one government and six industry partners. And more schools and industry partners are ready and interested to join the program. We are adapting the program into national educational system. We are also getting the PTEC students ready for European Qualification Framework 5 when finishing high school. And we have a thematic plan for the school year. We train the teachers. Lessons are supported by the experts from universities or from industry partners. Students are really educated in modern technologies, but also um, they are educated and skills needed for the for the jobs uh, like the the soft skills I mentioned. Uh, students, uh, we are planning multidisciplinary students project, which is very important. Um, we have methodology of program outcome evaluation, which was prepared by the college partner 
here in Czech Republic and uh, students and teachers evaluate each lesson so that we can follow their progress and reflect the feedback. We are using online education platform with certified courses. We are also innovating employment of distance learning in PTEC schools. Uh, there is opportunity for all partners to prepare new educational content. We are using mentoring, planning internships and job shadowing. Trainings for students and teachers are also very successful part. And we are organizing expert lectures, workshops with practical activities and nowadays mostly webinars. And um, to tackle also the question several times risen by the speakers here, how to connect private and public spheres and how to motivate companies to take part in the education, I would like to point out that in my opinion, this is the only way how to make real changes. It costs more time and energy to implement program with many partners, but it's definitely worth it. I would like to share with you that from my experiences, the companies are more motivated to make these changes. They understand digitalization is a need for them and they need the people with skills for this era. So where I can see less motivation for changes is the public sector. Schools often see the changes as uh, another project that will not work in practice or more work for teachers. And that is also another direction how we are developing PTEC in Czech Republic. We are showing teachers by examples that we want to make their work easier, not more difficult. And it's not such a big issue. From my experiences, teachers need the positive impulse. We are bringing new content. We are training the teachers. We are motivating them. And it's um, really uh, very positive to see how quickly they can start to do um, much better uh, content uh, with the students. Public-private partnership is crucial and I think we are doing well on this field. Recently we were awarded by regional government founder of schools in Czech Republic for leading by example the cooperation on PTEC and its support and um, also both speakers were um, talking about importance of distance learning. Um, I can see big progress when I compare PTEC distance learning this spring and now. We were preparing for the possibility that schools might be closed again during the summer. Teachers are working with PTEC content online. We equipped students with Arduino kits. They have their own cloud space and so on. So they even can implement some practical projects online. Uh, and even in May and June, we were preparing online webinars with industry partner experts. Very popular among students and teachers was webinar led by our lead of artificial intelligence research and development, who shared with students um, in two lessons the story of our famous chatbot Aneshka, who was prepared as a quick reaction on the COVID-19, answering questions of citizens of on Ministry of Health from the very beginning of the pandemic. And this project inspired other EU countries. The webinar was followed by practical workshop for students uh, where they prepare their own chatbot. And IBM is bringing now a new tool which can be of a help during online education, which is called Open PTEC. Open PTEC is online educational platform with courses. It's free, accessible for all and prepared specifically for age group 16 to 23 years. It derives from long term experiences with IBM compulsory education for employees. You can find their courses with um, similar topics, as I mentioned, uh, for PTEC. So it's cybersecurity artificial intelligence, blockchain, but also this problem solving, project management and uh, communication topics. For those who pass the courses, there are digital badges which can be shared on social media or in CV. And currently I'm discussing with National Pedagogical Institute, which is the focal point in Czech Republic for the digitally signed credentials system of uh, European Commission DG employment to include it into this system and least on the national level. 
We are we were using Open P Tech uh, this summer during IT summer camps for girls, and we have very positive feedback from students. And because it is in English, it can be used by students in all EU countries. And last but not least, I would like to invite you all to join our programs. And uh, this way, I think we can have bigger impact on education in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Christina, and thanks for your speech, but more importantly for what you are doing. Um, let me ask uh, one question to uh, put your PTEC or similar projects together. You need to put together four groups of people. Uh, you need to get the founder of the school or ministry. You need uh, some company that is supporting that. You need the teachers and you need the students. What is the most difficult part from this point of view? I would say that it's the teachers. It's It was the most difficult part to persuade them that this is not bringing them more work and that this will really work in practice. This is a good question uh, uh, about how to make sure that uh, they will have less work because this is the one problem that we are facing and, and then uh, at the end I will ask everyone on that. Uh, we want to promote skills that are not sufficiently covered uh, these days by curriculum. So that means to teachers do more than, than the students to learn more. That is uh, sometimes out of the capacity that we have. So that means to do something more and better we need to do something else a little bit less. Uh, is it the way of thinking that schools, uh, teachers, uh, founders of schools understood? Uh, yes. Um, and I think because we are starting with uh, IT lessons, because as you also mentioned, the IT lessons are very problematic, at least here in Czech Republic. Uh, uh, students uh, learn even in high school about one year about Word, one year about Excel and so on. So um, within these lessons, um, after we persuaded the leadership of the school, which was the most difficult part, that the group of IT teachers could understand it and they welcomed that we are bringing the new content and new, new examples of activities for them. So um, yeah, they, and then they really changed what what they are doing within the lessons, which which was great, and it really just um, costed us to prepare this content for the school year and uh, to train the teachers. And during the school year, of course, we are supporting them from different sites with lectures or um, some activities that the experts from the business or from um, university can do with the students as well. So thank you very much, Christina. Now it's time to move to uh, our third speaker. Uh, when I talked about free clubs where kids are learning the IT, uh, IT education, uh, I found when uh, personally visiting Code Dojo clubs or participating in the Code Week uh, in, uh, in uh, European Parliament, uh, that uh, one of the most popular tools how to learn about IT and especially immediately see how to use it are small ro robots made by many firms, including the one of our next speaker. I was also very pleased to learn that within this firm there is systematic effort to contribute to improvement of IT skills, especially of kids through coding clubs for, for children called uh, uh, code clubs. I hope we will learn more about this great project for our next speaker, who is Katherine Liedbetter from uh, Raspberry PI Foundation. Uh, she works as the program coordinator for free education program Coder Code Club and also support uh, the sister program Coder Dojo. She is graduating in astronomy. She was graduating in, uh, in astronomy from University College of London and she discovered firsthand the discrepancy between lack of coding education at school level 
and expectations uh, on young people at university. So, uh, so Katrin has decided to aim for young people, regardless of their background, to have an opportunity to learn coding and basic skills. She works for education-based AGO and now supports thousands of educators and volunteers in over 80 countries across the world to teach the digital skills to young people uh, in their communities. So, tell us about your experience. Thanks so much, Ludo. That was a brilliant introduction. Um, and good morning, everybody. It's fabulous to be here today. Um, as Ludo said, I'm speaking today on a subject that's quite dear to my heart as a STEM graduate who, who found that when I got to university, my education had not prepared me for the for the things that lay ahead. So today I'm going to be speaking about the Raspberry Pi Foundation, which is my organisation. Um, I'll be speaking about our programmes and the way that we support young people to learn. And also I'll be talking a little bit about our response to the pandemic and the challenges that that threw up as well. So I'm just going to share my screen, if that, just bear with me one second. Okay. Oh, I might need your help, Flipper, to share the slides if that's possible. My, my system is, is not cooperating with me. Is that possible? If not, I will just talk through the slides. I'll just talk through the slides. Um, so it's okay, we can see that. Oh, you can see the slides. Fabulous. I can't see the slides. Um, great. So. Uh, I'm talking today about the Raspberry Pi Foundation. For those of you who don't know about the foundation, um, we work to put the power of computing and digital making into the hands of young people around the world. Um, so what that means is that we want to allow more people to be able to harness the power of computing and digital technologies for work, but also to solve problems that matter to them and to also express themselves creatively as well. Um, as Ludek has mentioned, as Christina has mentioned, um, and Madam Commissioner, the pace of technology development is, is rapidly increasing and more and more young people are being left behind um, and what we want to do is to support them to solve the problems that matter to them but also to ensure that they aren't consigned as just digital consumers that they're able to use digital uh, making technology to create things for, for themselves and to, to solve the problems that matter to them and just speaking for the UK at the moment 39% of UK schools don't offer computer science at GCSE level which is for 16 year olds um, but computing jobs are predicted to grow at twice the rate of other jobs as well so we are seeing an increasingly large gap here between the skills available to young people, between the roles that are available to them in the future and the things that they will need to know as basic skills. And so how are we addressing this at the foundation? We're doing that in a few different ways. Um, so we're, we're first of all doing that through free computing clubs, um, through Code Club and Coda Dojo, which I'll speak on more in a minute, um, but through supporting uh, young people to learn at these free clubs around the world. We're also supporting computing in the curriculum. So we work with uh, policymakers, with ed uh, educational uh, sectors uh, to make sure that, that computing is something that is, is considered valuable and is, is accessible to young people as part of the coding curricula at school. We also support research, so making sure that we are finding out the problems that matter, where we can have the most impact for young people across the world. And we also offer hardware, so we create a small uh, credit card sized computer, which is a low cost piece of hardware that allows access for many young people who may not be able to afford more expensive hardware um, that can be used in industry and that can also be used in education as well. So through these four different, uh, four different methods, we're trying to support more people to access uh, coding and digital making skills. And I want to talk more on our programme. So Code Club is, is obviously a programme very dear to my heart. I've worked for Code Club now for four years. Um, and Code Club is an educational network of, of global volunteers and educators running extracurricular coding clubs for young people aged nine to 13. So these clubs are free. And the aim of these clubs is to help inspire the next generation to become excited about computing and digital making. Um, so Code Club was founded in 2012, around the time that uh, the UK curriculum changed to include coding. Um, so it started as a UK initiative but has since become global. Um, these clubs are mostly run in schools um, although they do also run in, in community spaces as well and they are designed to be fun and relaxed spaces so they exist outside of the school day either at lunch times or after school hours uh, where young people can come together and can, can be creative with code. 
And at the moment, we have 19,000 registered code clubs around the world. Um, those aren't all active at the moment due to challenges of the pandemic. But we do have active clubs now running in 80 countries. And we also have eight local partner communities on the ground. So we have uh, local communities in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, where local teams are supporting young people um, with local concerns. And I've just added a little club uh, club leaders quote card here from some of the things that we've, we've said, uh, we've heard our club leaders say. Lots of them talk to us about how they feel that Coco empowers their students, how it's easy for them to use and how it also allows um, young people to, to engage with coding regardless of their background as well. And so the sister programme of Code Club is Coda Dojo, which I know is very dear to Ludek's heart as well as he's worked with Coda Dojo in the Czech Republic. Um, very similar programmes, but Coda Dojo has a slightly larger age remit working with young people aged 7 to 17. Um, with Coda Dojo, which was founded in 2011, lots of people involved in that as our, as our volunteers, as our mentors for young people, are people who are working in the tech sector. So they establish clubs in, in companies, in community spaces, libraries, where they can come back, they can share the skills that they've learned within their jobs um, and they can allow young people to to be empowered to discover how they can also create using those skills as well and at the moment there are now more than 2300 coda dojo spread across 40 plus countries so those range from japan where there's a really thriving community to the czech republic to the us and to parts of africa as well so for both code club and coda dojo it's fantastic to see that we have this incredible global community and that there is real interest and excitement um, to support young people regardless of background to code across the world And so both of these programmes, both Code Club and Coda Dojo, were established as separate NGOs, but have since merged within the Raspberry Pi Foundation because we knew that that would allow us to access more young people and to, to allow more young people to access high quality resources as well. But we have a lot of key similarities. Both Code Club and Coda Dojo are free programmes as well. So they are free for, for teachers or for volunteers to register. And we also ask that they are free for young people to attend so that regardless of background, any young person is able to attend a Code Club or a Coda Dojo. They're also globally accessible. So as you saw there, Code Clubs and Coda Dojos have registered all across the world. And we have open access resources. So one of the most fantastic things about the Raspberry Pi Foundation is we have an incredible team that create uh, amazing coding projects and resources. You can see some of them here on the right. We have a scratch project which uses block coding, which is great for new coders to learn the kind of basics of coding concepts. Uh, and they make a ghost busting game, which is a nice, very popular one around Halloween time. Um, we also have a project here using a Raspberry Pi emulator. Um, so young people can have a go at using hardware, even if they don't have access to that hardware uh, where they are. And we also have a project here that uses Python to create a role playing game as well. So young people may have played role playing games. They now have the opportunity to create their own using the skills that they learn in these clubs. And another similarity, the key similarity is that these clubs are volunteer led. So we provide resources, we provide projects and support. But the, pro the clubs themselves are run by teachers, are run by volunteers around the world. And without them, these clubs would not be possible. And for both Code Club and Coda Dojo, I think it's just important to note, we are working to create an army of future developers. The kind of aim of these is not to push young people into coding careers. But what we do want to do is ensure that all young people are learning the coding and digital making skills as a basic skill, as they might learn to, to read or might learn to write, because these skills will become increasingly important in the future. And so we do that in a way that's fun for them, is accessible, allows them to create things that they're excited by uh, using code and using digital making. And I just wanted to share a couple of, of key stats from our 2019 survey. Um, so we found uh, in that survey that 40% of co-club attendees and 33% of Coda Dojo attendees are girls, which we were really pleased by. Obviously, we're always pushing to have that as, as a 50-50 split, but that's an ongoing piece of work. Uh, we found that 94% of co-club volunteers and educators agreed the young people in their clubs had improved their programming skills. And we found that 90% of volunteers agreed that young people in their dojos had improved confidence in their computer skills. So for both co-club and for Coda Dojo, we saw these improvements around skills, around confidence using those skills as well. Uh, but we also saw improvements in soft skills as well. So uh, consistently, we saw volunteers and, and educators telling us they saw an increased ability to solve problems with computers and that young people were also better at teaching their, their peers as well. Within code clubs and code dojos, there's a lot of a social element. Young people will often work together. Um, and, and within that framework, they were able to kind of build those skills as well as learning about coding and digital making. 
Now I share those those wonderful uh, stats with the kind of you know key point that they were from the 2019 survey, and obviously a lot has changed during the past year. Um, this year has been particularly, I think, full of challenges for our community. We work with a lot of schools and a lot of educators who were forced to shut their schools for, for long periods of time, and were also put under immense pressure over the past few months. Um, and for the young people we work with as well, who were often you know getting involved with their school from home, having to have access to hardware poor internet connections all sorts of challenges came up there um, so we listened and we responded we wanted to make sure that what we were doing was going to serve the community as well as possible so we spoke to volunteers and educators through focus groups we created online guidance to help coding clubs run online or remotely or in person if it was safe to do so in their region um, and we also ran community calls as well so myself and my colleague Nula have been running a series of calls based on all sorts of topics from best practice of online sessions to safeguarding um, to making sure uh, that you know how to structure an online session and also training for for our club leaders as well to help them build their skills trying to make sure that we're responding as much as possible so that those educators those volunteers were able to then go away and reach the young people in their clubs as well and across the foundation we've been working really hard to uh, adapt our offering, offerings and to create new offerings to ensure that we're continuing to reach those young people so I just wanted to share ooh, I just wanted to share a few um, kind of stories from clubs, uh, a few of our clubs that have been running over the past few months. We have Leeds Library Co Club here um, at the top left, which is an amazing club that was running uh, from home over the past few months. They've been making a platform game based on a book they're reading and just using this as an opportunity to encourage reading from home and coding from home. Um, Voiden Dojo in the Netherlands. Uh, have been working on in-person sessions now that it's safe to do so, but working with smaller uh, groups, making sure that pre-booking is done, that young people have awareness of hygiene regulations and still managing to run their sessions in person. And we also have an amazing uh, Coda Dojo and co-club leader in Iraq called Ali. Ali's been running these live stream sessions on YouTube with his son Mustafa, running those in Arabic to ensure that local children can uh, connect to coding in their local language and that they can connect to coding from home. He's also just run his first in-person session as well in a cinema with, with restrictions and plexiglass all sort of set up to make sure it was safe. So we have an amazing community across the world and without them we wouldn't have been able to, to, to continue supporting young people to code over the past few months. And at the foundation, we've been working as well to change our offering as well, to, so to support particularly parents, but also teachers who perhaps weren't able to run their club. We launched Digital Making at Home, which is a direct -to learner experience. Um, we ran weekly code along videos, weekly blogs and also live streams. And those were based on a series of different themes from games to storytelling and to art and also for going outside. Just fun themes that we thought kids would find exciting and engaging as well. Um, and we involved young people in those live streams, so it wasn't just members of our team we had amazing members of the community who are young people who code with us to come along to try these projects and to share their own experiences as well um, so that launched over in march and since has seen 100,000 plus views um, and also we've seen 2,000 people move from those streams from that content over to the Raspberry Pi project site where they can uh, they can access those projects that we create those free coding materials as well and possibly my favourite thing that we've done since um, the, the pandemic happened is, is Coolest Projects Online. So Coolest Projects is the world's leading technology fair for young people. And it's an opportunity for young people to take a problem or something that they want to create, to go away and make that and then to showcase that project. And normally Coolest Projects will run as an in-person event. So we've run this in the past in uh, the UK and in Ireland and the US. Um, but this year we weren't able to run our international event, so we took it online. Um, and what was fantastic about that is it allowed young people, regardless of where they were, to engage. So they didn't have to travel, they didn't have to worry about costs or anything like that. And that meant that 39 different countries had young people participating. Um, we also saw 775 young creators submit projects that they'd made, uh, and that was 560 projects overall as well. So those projects were showcased in an online gallery, which you can sort of see here on the right. Um, and we had a celebrity panel choose our, uh, our favourites as well, which included a, on that panel an astronaut and also um, the creator of Scratch as well. So that was really exciting for the young people involved. Um, but it was incredibly inspiring. We saw an amazing diversity of projects from young people creating um, an animated conversation on living with autism. We saw projects on microbiology games. Uh, we saw lots of projects around coronavirus and how young people were responding to that as well. So it was a fantastic opportunity for them to put the skills that they'd learned into context with real world issues, with real world problems that mattered to them as well. 
And so that's a kind of whistle stop tour of a lot of the things that we've been doing um, in terms of what's next. There's there's many different things that we're looking at, and as well as our clubs programs, which we're continuing to support and continuing to adapt. Um, we have recently launched AstroPi, which is an opportunity for young people to uh, send their code into space to run on the International Space Station. And um, there will be more coolest projects coming in the near future. Um, and also we're doing work as well to support young people to, to access uh, to access hardware and other things through various initiatives with partners as well. So there's lots going on at the foundation. But if you'd like to find out more, I've added a few links there as well um, to our various different websites. But I will I will pause now uh, and hand back over to Ludek. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Katrin. Uh, I will now uh, just ask you a question uh, because your company operates globally and also your foundation and your clubs are uh, operating globally. So uh, do you see any kind of uh, significant differences between how uh, your project is doing across the, 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 the world and how is EU standing, Europe standing from the point of view acquiring necessary IT, uh, IT skills by uh, young kids? That's a really, really good question. It, it's very diverse and it very much depends on different different countries and their kind of standings. We often see in countries where uh, coding is part of the curriculum that, that these these different strands do better because it's something that, that teachers are, are kind of thinking about. It's something that they really value and their time is very precious. So where it's something that they are given time to work on, we are able to kind of support them with that. Um, We've also seen obviously recently that there are huge diversities in how people are able to engage depending on the local situation. We've been really lucky. We've got big communities in New Zealand and Australia where the pandemic has been quite, quite, you know, minimized and those communities are thriving. And it's it's been much more of a challenge for places like the UK, where we've had quite a lot of a lot of struggle, a lot of schools have been closed for a long period of time. Um, in terms of the EU, it's again, it's again very diverse. Um, we have a couple of uh, local partners working to support code clubs and, and code dojos on the ground across the EU. And I think in those countries, we've really seen a huge difference. I think having someone on the ground who's able to support having you know, translated resources and things like that has made a massive difference to, to the ability of access for those different programs as well. Um, but I think it's absolutely vital that the policymakers and that, you know, schools and, and educators have that buy in for these programs to be successful. Thank you very much. Uh, now it's time to move to the third, uh, last not least speaker. Uh, and in her speech uh, or in via her participation, uh, we would like to know how the problems of IT skills, IT education or generally skills needed for the future jobs are addressed by the large, very successful corporation. That's why we are lucky to have uh, as our last speaker, uh, Mrs. Natalie Erard, that serves as the head of Europe and NATO affairs from Airbus. Similar to IBM and uh, Airbus also tries to invest into young people education and motivate them into the career in STEM. We are keen to listen her perspective uh, and learn more about her program. Concerning her CV, she works in Airbus from uh, 2005 uh, in different posts and is from uh, 2012 uh, head of Europe and NATO affairs. Before that, she worked as an external auditor with Pricewaterhouse uh, since uh, 1995, and she made her acquaintance with the with the uh, uh, airline uh, airspace business. Then she worked in technical France and US, and also as a head in Thomson Europe Asia Corporate Audit. She holds a degree from France Institute uh, Minest Telecom Business School. So, uh, Natalie, now floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, of course, uh, Airbus welcomed the opportunity to uh, speak about uh, uh, the future jobs. And uh, this is as well because uh, the alternative would be a future without jobs. I'm not saying that because our sector, uh, aeronautics, uh, especially space defense, is hardly hit by the COVID-19 crisis. I'm saying that because as Airbus, we have a unique view uh, on our European workforce. We are, as you said, uh, a global success. We are designing, manufacturing, selling aircraft, helicopter, space system, defense system in the world. And we are exporting more than 80% of our aircraft outside Europe. But on the other hand, more than 90% of our workforce sits in Europe. So we have this unique view 
of what the world will require from our European workforce. And when we look at the trend, digitalization, including the necessity to develop digital twins where an aircraft will never be developed as it used to be, manufacturing services uh, are going to be different. Digitalization, robotization, automatization are the new trend. It means that the jobs as they are now will not exist in the future. They will be kind of merged with these new digital trends. So how do we look at that and how are we trying this to, to, to go through this long journey at Airbus? I will give a, a, a few examples in three categories. The first one is to define the necessary skill. The second is to inspire new students. And the third is to upskill our current workforce. So to, to define the skills, we have uh, several alternatives, but uh, the, the pillar of it is uh, the global workforce forecast for 2019-2029. And obvi obviously it's, uh, it's focusing on looking at the future and what are, which skills are going to be necessary, how uh, our workforce will have to evolve, how the jobs will evolve. And on that, we are very much wishing to expand and not only to stay at Airbus, not only to stay even at the sectorial level, but uh, to work with the EU uh, to look, to have really a, a, a global view on that. Uh, on defining the skills, we are already working on a sectorial project with the EU, with the blueprint defense sectorial skills. And therefore that gives an idea of how we can work together uh, to look at the future and uh, precisely define what are going to be the jobs of, of the future. The second effort we are making is to inspire students. Why? Because you see, Airbus always inspired engineers, of course, but we'll, we need to inspire new engineers, people who are not necessarily thinking of Airbus as the immediate uh, uh, next job. And this is the digital arena. So that's why we build uh, some partnerships. Uh, first, with 26 universities across the world, uh, a global partnership university uh, that, that Airbus uh, decided to pursue. And this is to reach out to new engineers, to new skills, to new students, to show them how STEM and I would say more traditional aerodynamics, uh, um, systems, mechanics, uh, electronics uh, are going to merge and that they will have a very exciting future on our sector. Another uh, program that we are uh, uh, pursuing as well is uh, Fly Your Ideas and this is made with UNESCO and the idea is to give some very concrete examples, very concrete topics that, that we have or questions that we have and invite people, students with digital skills to contribute and to find a solution. It's a competitive process and therefore we, we welcome a lot of uh, uh, new brains working on those, on those topics. It doesn't mean that we are only working with the uh, engineers level. Uh, we are working as well with the production side and we have a lycée Airbus where on, in the lycée, uh, 350 students per year are learning how to use digital uh, skills on top of manufacturing skills. So as you can see, it's at, at, at all levels that we're trying to, to reach out. The third uh, pillar of, uh, uh, of this strategy of future job is about the upskilling of the workforce, of course, because the current workforce will have to evolve. Uh, we have great expertise, know-how, uh, which have been built across Europe uh, along decades. And we obviously need to help them uh, evolve and get uh, the, the digitalization of, uh, of their job. And, uh, and as well, we ensure and inspire them. So it is uh, absolutely critical, especially at the time of COVID, I must say that those people who are highly skilled 
um, can see a future. They are aware of the digitalization, of the big disruptions of our society. We are in the midst of a crisis, so we need all together to upskill them. Think about friends, uh, brothers, uh, uh, sisters uh, working right now on those, on, on those topics. I mean, the, the conjunction of so much uncertainty uh, is a requirement for us to work together rapidly uh, to structure programs to show them there's, there, there's a real venue, there's a real future uh, in, 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 their, in their job, which will remain critical, but in a different way. So having said that, let me conclude. Um, I would say I only concur with the previous speakers that uh, we need to work all together because uh, the task is huge, the journey will be long, and there's a lot to do, a lot to develop. Uh, we are fully committed to making that journey with, with the EU. We, we find those who have spared the efforts. Uh, we think that uh, a lot of initiative on digital stems, the packs for skills, for aerospace and defense, are very much welcome initiatives. And to conclude, I will, if you allow me, express one wish. When I was a student in telecommunication, my friends and I were dreaming about the potential of the World Wide Web. Let me wish that today, across the EU, young students, young engineers, are now dreaming about designing with digital, with digital tools the first zero emission aircraft of Airbus as a trans-European program. Thanks a lot for your invitation, Mr. Niedermayer. Thank you very much for sharing with us uh, your views. Uh, uh, let me ask uh, one question. I can see that just above your shoulder there is a poster of your new uh, A350 aircraft that is uh, probably one of the most state-of-art aircraft these days. I wonder if you can make a rough estimate. Uh, what role uh, is IT playing in designing, producing this aircraft compared to previous generation like A330 or A340 that was launched, I guess, like 30 years ago? How big is the difference? The difference is, is, is huge because we're starting, we started with the A350 for the first time to build a, a, a quasi digital twin. Uh, it means that uh, instead of having different set of digital manufacturing across Europe, we are now having one tool, uh, one concept, where all the aircraft, the systems, the interactions are being modeled. So from the very onset, you have a real digital twin. The second aspect is the fact that we're including the whole supply chain in, 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 into the IT system. So a very collaborative approach. We created a collaborative platform for the A350 where everybody gathered together to understand the, the, the aircraft from the onset. That was unique. And going forward, there will be, as I said, more and more automatization and robotization. It means that the work of people in uh, making a part, in assembling uh, uh, components, will be hugely different because they will use all the tools, uh, which, which means that they will have either uh, uh, to, uh, to, to, to change the way they work uh, or that we will need new skills. Uh, so as you can see, the, the, the A350 is only the start of a journey uh, not everything has been done 100% digital, but uh, a more significant extent has been uh, has been achieved in terms of digitalization of the processes. Thank you very much. And my guess is that the same is going on in different industry, for example, like car manufacturing, when you hear roughly the same questions, the same answers from the firms that are now leading the industry. But I guess <clears throat> this was a very good end of our presentation of uh, speakers. And now we have like 15 minutes for for exchange of views. Uh, Teresa sent me some questions that she has seen uh, on uh, the, uh, the Facebook where we are streaming the event. And let me start with the second one that is quite an obvious uh, and usual concern of some people, uh, especially the, uh, the uh, mothers and fathers of the young kids, because there is a concern that the more capable they will be in IT world, 
they will uh, replace some activities that are taking uh, outside of IT world with just staring on their mobile phones, tablets and computers. And as we know, in cyberspace, you can find uh, not only great things, but also the things that are not so great. So how would you respond to such uh, parents that have concern about enhancing the ability of, of their, their, uh, their kids uh, in this area? Who wants to start? Uh, can we start with Christina and just take the same order? Yeah, I, I would say that it's not only about the digital skills, as I mentioned several times, but it's also about the skills for, for the jobs or IBM calls it new, new color uh, jobs, um, which is in fact uh, putting education into in in line with the today's reality which i think at least in czech republic um the the current education system doesn't reflect the the current reality in jobs so that's why our industry partners are joining ptech program because they they can see that the, that it's not only digital skills that the, the students after finishing high school are missing but also other very practical things like problem solving, um, communication and so on. Um, and um, also I would like to point out one more thing that cybersecurity is actually important part crucial for programs like PTEC because um, our students really need to know what are the, the dangers that they can uh, meet in digital space. Thank you. Now, Katrin. We don't hear you. Uh, Sorry, there we go. Sorry about that. That was my mute button. I'd like to echo a lot of what uh, Christina said. I think um, that it's important to, to share with parents that young people are not necessarily just learning about digital skills, but there is so much more that can be gained from those clubs. Um, but I think particularly for our clubs, one of the most important things is, is we're not just allowing young people to go onto a computer and play games for an hour. What we're doing is we're teaching them how they can not just become a consumer of technology, but they can then build their own things and create with technology as well. And I think that's such a vital skill to, to understand what works behind a computer. How is, you know, how does a computer work? What is behind code? What's behind a website? Then they can then take those skills and, and create their own things. Um, but I'd also like to echo what Christina said about security being very important. So as part of clubs we also encourage you know teaching you internet safety and things like that it's really important for young people to be aware um of, of those dangers and for the people running our clubs to be aware of how to keep the young people of them safe as well thank you and now natalie well i would say i understand the concerns because you see on cyber security uh, even the the corporations are, are, are attacked very regularly so uh, uh, the fact that uh, there are dangers in the in the cyberspace is uh, is the truth and uh, and we need to collectively look at uh, how we defend our interest being the economic interest or the people's interest uh, protect the youngest and the, and, and 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 the weakest uh, that's that's why, by the way, I don't think the digital agenda is only about technology or skills. It's as well about regulation. It's uh, uh, as well about uh, an evolving agenda on uh, uh, threats and opportunities. Uh, and there needs to, and we need to find a balance collectively so that uh, we're embracing the uh, the technology, the future, the change, because this is the only way to succeed. But that we don't forget that uh, there are uh, there are substantial risk. Uh, if uh, we let it completely non-regulated out of uh, uh, out of any monitoring, so uh, it's uh, it's obviously a very important topic. Thank you. There was the other question that was focusing on availability of good tools at the school levels. Uh, so that means something like uh, like a robots, uh, like a raspberries, Mindstorm, or the other sometimes even basic equipment. To which extent you think that across the Europe uh, this is the bottleneck uh, of our effort, or do you think that in there are different aspects that are the ones that are 
causing not very, I would say, very uh, quick uh, way forward in uh, the digitalization and in IT skills of our society. Let me now start with Kat. Uh, that's a really good question. I think um, we've experienced for a long time different difficulties with our clubs of actually managing to get hold of hardware. What we do try and do is make it as easy as possible. So the Raspberry Pi Foundation is is tool agnostic. You don't have to have a Raspberry Pi to engage with our materials or our, our club materials. Um, and we support Co Clubs Coda Dojos to run with just the laptops that they may have at, at that space. Um, so that is, is something that, that has been, you know, generally quite, quite helpful for schools and for libraries who already generally have some materials and some hardware available. Um, there can be challenges and, and we try and support clubs where necessary to, to speak to companies who can potentially support with old hardware and, and to connect them with that. And we are now working to do some uh, do some connection with partners of accessing uh, hardware and Raspberry Pis for people who are in more disadvantaged communities in the UK. So looking at what we can do there to connect those young people with with hardware as well. Um, but it is it is a challenge and it, it's an ongoing problem that I think we need to continue working on because access to hardware, especially now during the pandemic, is, is becoming an increasingly big challenge for young people who may have to share their, their laptop, their computer with multiple siblings and may not always have access to that kind of technology. Um, so it's definitely an ongoing issue. Thank you. Now, Natalie. Well, obviously, Kate is much more expert than I am on 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 that question but uh, for me that's that's an, an area of concern because uh, I mean in, in the past you see merits and hard work were uh, the, the two pillars of uh, what drove uh, uh, people to, to climb the social ladder. Um, it would be terrible to see uh, a society where uh, having access to, uh, to digital tools and efficient ones at the, an early age uh, would make the difference from uh, from the very beginning, uh, and uh, and I think it would have uh, consequences, negative consequences, on the way people collide for uh, uh, a united uh, uh, EU. So uh, I, I think this uh, digital divide is uh, is a key question. Uh, we are working uh, uh, on, on on space constellation. To, uh, to try to uh, bring the uh, digitalization to, to the citizen uh, wherever they are. Uh, and I think it's a very important uh, societal uh, topic to pursue and, and invest so that uh, people are, are not running into huge disadvantage uh, because uh, they don't have the same level of uh, IT tools at their disposal. Thank you. And last not least, Christina. Thank you. Yeah, the question was aiming um, on the tools like Lego, Mindstorms, Arduino, and I would say that, that the, the tools are probably not so important, but, but what Kat said, uh, to let the kids do what they really would like to do, and this way motivate them to, to do much more than they are now doing at school. And uh, I think concrete guidance for the teachers and their training is needed on this field. And also some pushing from the from the government side. Um, uh, it's, it's also very important, especially in Czech Republic, where the system of education is very decentralized. So often it's the decision of the director what will be the content. So here is also important um, from the from the founders to to push for implementing these innovative programs and of course invite industry partners is crucial not only because they can give the the equipment but because they can give the expertise thank you very much and <clears throat> i guess we are now approaching slowly the end of uh, our debate so let me uh, let me open the last round of your intervention by asking two questions and obviously encouraging you to uh, make any other comment the questions are uh, first of all how you see uh, the current situation of europe uh, in that global competition for for uh, I would not say for IT leadership, but at least for high level of IT competencies. The second, what would be the most pressing one thing that you would uh, recommend the European states and the governments to do to get better? And last not least, uh, if you may, uh, if you have any remarks concerning our today's exchange of you. And let me this time uh, start with Natalie. Yes, th thank you. Um, 
Well, I, I think you see Europe is in uh, not an easy position when you look at uh, the, the global competition. We uh, we all know the uh, the US has uh, uh, invested a lot in its uh, digital tools. The, uh, the 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 GAFA pretty much dominated the. Uh, the, the, the B2C, the, the, the platform side, and we see a significant amount of investment in, in China. And on our side, uh, in the aeronautics parts, today we're competing against the US, and 10, 15 years from now, the duopoly will be broken, and China will enter the, the market as well. So we can see that on some key uh, strategic sectors, key strategic technologies, uh, we will have a, a battle an economic battle, of course, uh, of, of continents. Uh, and for, for, for Europe, in my opinion, the question will be, are we going to be a player or not? So this is, this is part what we are really facing right now. Uh, however, I would not uh, uh, conclude uh, that uh, we are, uh, that the, the situation is desperate. Uh, there, there's a lot to do. Uh, there is a knowledge uh, on, uh, on on the industry side, uh, on uh, as I said, the, the industrial processes, uh, the the uh, which could enable uh, Europe to be uh, much better in terms of uh, uh, the B two B aspect of digitalization, and, and and this is why our collective efforts uh, are also important. And this is why what I would recommend is uh, uh, to structure the debate, uh, not to duplicate efforts so that uh, we are we are efficient, but that on the other hand, we are not shy in investing because it's investing in, ta in taking risk, which brings success, especially when you go through a disruptive period uh, or disruptive technologies. Uh, so let's hope we have the courage to take risk, maybe a couple of failures, but uh, hopefully at the end of the day, huge success. Thank you. It sounds uh, it sounds good for me. Uh, Christina. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I think uh, what is crucial is the cooperation of the public and private sector on education because it's really a big issue and the public sector will not solve it on, on its own and also try to limit the disadvantages of, of some groups that are now um, becoming bigger and bigger. Thank you. Now, Kathleen. I think that perhaps one of the most pressing things we can do, we know that there is so much interest, that there's so much potential across Europe, but I think probably the most important thing is, is to make this kind of learning more accessible to, to, to get rid of the fear around, you know, coding digital skills. That's this big, scary thing and to support teachers to do these early interventions, to, to make sure that they understand that they don't have to be experts or, or coding, you know, whizzes to actually support young people to learn the basic skills that they need. So I think that one of the most important things is for this to become a really important topic on, on the school curriculum for more support from governments to teach this to young people so that teachers aren't really doing this alone. Um, and I think that would make a huge difference. You're on mute. That's good. So I can do it again. So, <laughs> so let me now thanks to all organizers, uh, Teresa, Philip, and uh, obviously to all participants, including uh, uh, now missing Madam Co uh, Commissioner, that I was very pleased to see her here. I guess we now talk about many different angles, and it should be understood that this is not just a question for a small number of people that has kind of technocratic nature. It is a multi-dimensional problem that is concerning all the society. I was very happy to hear that social accent that is very important. We are, we are talking here about future of our society. Obviously, it has a very strong the business angle because now it's hard to uh, succeed in business without uh, being able to acquire the competencies and to have uh, right people. And it has also strategic uh, dimension that has to do something with the uh, current global competition in the economy where the IT uh, ITs will play very 
important role. So I hope we were at least able to highlight some of these issues and propose some solutions and most importantly show some examples how to move forward. So I'm very grateful for your participation and I hope we will together succeed, not necessarily be the best, but at least do quite well for us, for Europeans, for our kids. So thank you very much and maybe see you next time in some other similar debate and have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.